when you think about entrepreneurship and bringing it into your life and, and, and becoming in, immersed in that world, what's the value of the learning lessons you get in that experience versus your own experience when you spent time in a university style education? This is going to sound really crass and it's a bit jokey, but it's basically reap all the rewards and everyone else can do it. How exactly can you grow your money by understanding the flow of energy and developing a wealth mindset? What exactly is bioenergetics and how are you in a position where you can find a way that energy can implement into your financial life? We're joined together by Harry Massey to talk a little bit about his company, NES Health Bioenergetic Systems, how he's on the forefront of creating brand new technology uh, to help create exponential health in your life and how exponential health has a corollary effect to your wealth. So we're excited to have you on the program today. We've been trying to line up this podcast for a while. Exciting to be with you. And uh, you've got a lot of really cool things happening on your entrepreneurial journey. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to share some of those entrepreneurial lessons that you've learned along the way uh, to help infuse that into our listeners here at Wealth Without Bay Street. Thanks for being on the program today. Uh, thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start with finding out a little bit about what brought you into the entrepreneurial space to begin with. You're, you're at a certain place today on your journey, but it didn't start there. It started long ago. Walk us through your journey and what made you decide to go down an entrepreneurial track. Uh, so I'm 22 years into having, having our own company. Uh, for me, actually, it was a very, very unusual story. So when I was 21, I actually had these three climbing accidents and so the first one I was ice climbing um ice unfortunately is very brittle the ice shattered I fell down fractured my spine yeah. didn't know actually I'd fractured my spine um because I was only 20 at the time so I just carried on and went back to university um a few months later I was out I was out in the Alps I was also climbing I ended up getting a, a fever that time Got back off the got back off the mountain. Went back to university. Was sort of living life pretty full on, um, like partying all the time, climbing. I guess I was also doing exams and some studying, but that was a minor point. And by the end of that year, I got so so exhausted. I'd, I'd actually got um, glandular fever and ended up. I actually ended up with chronic fatigue syndrome. Took my first job in London and um, for Aon Capital Markets. So I was going to be a, a wanker banker. No, bankers are lovely. <laughs> but that was what I was going to do at the time. And I ended up, I ended up being fired from that job because I was because I was too sick. So I went back out to the to the Alps, thinking I could cure it with French food, exercise, wine, etc. That. That didn't actually work. So I, I basically ended up exhausting myself so much that time. I ended up stuck in a tent just eating dried bananas for 10 days. Drove all the way back to England, enrolled in an MVA because I didn't know what to do with myself because I couldn't get a job. Was too sick to do the MVA, so I split it over two years. I ended up completing that MVA in a in a wheelchair. And Actually, from then, I basically ended up I ended up bedridden at home for the next six or so years. And then I had just this incredible journey of trying to get my health back. Well, I did eventually get my health back, trying everything conventional, didn't work, tried all these different alternative things, um, nutritional approaches wasn't really working. Now, I, I just thought to myself, well, like, where on earth does energy come from because I don't have any of this stuff called energy and I came across the term of bioenergetics which is the study of energy and living systems so I was like looking up on it was Yahoo back then not Google um, trying to find <laughs> who the most prominent researchers were found this professor in Australia called Peter Fraser um, contacted him he sent me this paper said I don't know why I'm sending you this and it was a paper on quantum biology I was like, I didn't honestly understand it, but I knew, I knew he, he seemed like a smart guy. 
And then I had this sort of thought to myself. It's like, well, look, I'm sick. I can't get to any doctors because I couldn't drive a car. Wouldn't it be a good idea if there was some sort of way, well, I, I called it a home wellness system at the time, that could tell you how to get your health back from the comfort of your own home? I was like, well, if I could figure that out, I'd get my health back. It would help other people. And actually, I would escape this trap uh, that I was basically stuck at home with my parents. So I wrote back to him. Actually, I think I called him then and I sort of gave him that idea. And he was like, oh, that anyway, he liked he liked the idea. We ended up agreeing to meet in, in Los Angeles and he was from Australia, I was from England. We spent 10 days together and he was like, well, this there's this ridiculously sick kid, but, you know, he seems to be like quite motivated. <laughs> so if, well, if I can't get this kid better, then there's no hope in any of this idea going anywhere. So he then basically got my health back and that, I mean, I know this is a wealth podcast. So I don't, that's, that's a whole other, other track, but basically, basically uh, what he'd done is he'd mapped the energy of the human body and he was able to apply that to get my health back. And then we ended up co-inventing a system that could basically read the energy fields of your body and correct them and that was going to be this home wellness system but a friend's father because I was 20 I think I was 27 he just said to us well look you've got no money you don't have any customers yet it'd be a really bad idea to go to consumers so he said why don't you bring this out to practitioners so I said okay so we renamed it from home wellness system to Ness professional and then we ended up building out this practitioner channel business in England um, that did, you know, did pretty well. And we ended up expanding out across Europe, I think 10 years, 10, 11 years, actually for love. Um, uh, a psychic said I was going to move to America and fall in love. So I did. Um, I don't know whether it's because they put the idea in my head or um, or or they were psychic. I'm, I've never been sure about that. And ended up mo moving to America and building a company here. So yeah, that's the that's the short story or well, that's the the beginnings of the story not a very usual beginning no I, I would say that's definitely uh not, not one that we've heard before on the program and what's really fascinating about your journey Harry is uh, other than obviously the the, the health uh, uh challenges that you experienced is the ability to find out how that challenge caused you to rethink your thinking. And we talk a lot about rethinking your thinking here on this podcast. It's one of the things that we learned a lot from our mentor, R. Nelson Nash, who, who wrote the book, Become Your Own Banker. And being that you were challenged with mobility and and, and energy and, and the combination of those two things, you had a lot of time to obviously to think for yourself. And, and through that, it sounds like through that aspect of it is really what led you to figuring out how can you change. So there was a desire, motivation for change, which led you to start to figure out what that change could look like. How could you go about making it, which then led you to take some action, doing some research, going to the yahoos to find somebody who might be able to help you create that, that, that impact, that shift in your life. And then even in your condition, even just being able to get on a plane and, and make it for 10 days in Los Angeles, I'm sure it was not a you know, you, you just kind of blew that off. Like, well, I just got on a plane, but I don't imagine you, it was easy for you to just get on a plane and go to Los Angeles. So there was, uh, there was additional challenges that were there really that led up to that, to that action step of, of being in a position to even uh, be around someone who could, who could mentor and help provide the insights needed for you to get healthy. So that the journey, the question I have is the journey of going from that position to, to being in a healthy position how long did you say it, it took you to be in a position where you were you felt more like your old self and you and you had that energy back where you could now really start to delve into building uh building the practice that you created? You know, um I wanna I wanna tackle two things, but I'll answer that first, then I'll say what I was gonna say in response to what you just said. So it it, it took me about two two or so years to get most most of my health back. I mean, I had lost like I'd lost a third of my body weight you know I looked basically well yeah really really gaunt I didn't really have any strength so that that did take a little bit of time um but given that I've been bedroom for seven years two years relatively for me it, it really wasn't that length of time um but I just want to touch on something so 
everything you just said was super interesting so like in a in a life philosophy um we ended up about 10 years later after that incident we ended up making this film and wrote a book called choice point align your purpose um because something that really struck well I, there was there's a very big movement of of law of attraction and, and the secret um you know going across the us canada etc back 10 15 years ago it's still pretty popular now and something in it didn't quite strike me um, as totally true, which is the fact that you can't necessarily manifest anything. Um, And I knew in my story, it's not that I put on a mind map that I wanted the jet and the company and the money. Actually, the company came out of a very, very hard, what I would call choice or a massive crisis. And I just basically aligned, I'd aligned my purpose was something that was going to help other people i.e creating a great health you know great health products and you know in a company that help people get their health back so so how i would summarize that i i sort of summarize sort of a life philosophy in these three principles one is understand your world the second is align your purpose and the third is be the change so um if you actually want to you know, bring something to fruition like a company or, you know, create a lot of wealth by taking a lot of time into actually understanding the reality around you, the relationships, you know, how products or industries work, et cetera. Like it's really, really, really important because if you do that and then you you could say align your purpose or your intention or your actions, use any of those words. If you actually align what you're doing with that better understanding, it's far, far, far more likely to come to fruition. And it's more like, you know, if you take a sailing analogy, it's basically like having the wind behind you, or I guess a a big wave if you're, if you're surfing. Um, That to me is really the great secret of the law of attraction is if you've already aligned yourself with where patterns are going that can support you. And then the third aspect, you know, I think you used that word change. Um, is to be the change. So there are certain aspects that you have to change within yourself to be a match to that greater purpose. Um, I don't know, you know, it might be, you might have diff- wrong beliefs about money. You might not trust people. Uh, you, you know, you might be really bad at relationships. There might be certain skill sets you need. So, you know, along the way, you do have to change yourself to be a match to that purpose. Um, and if you do all three, you know, really, I'd say anything, not anything is possible because I think you have to understand your world, but great things can happen. I like that. Great things can happen. And I especially like the third aspect, you know, moving from understanding and, and shifting towards being the change. And really what I take away from that is recognizing that you yourself need to be aware that change might have to happen and, and to be to not roadblock it. You know, a lot of times we are our own worst enemy uh, in, in life. And usually it's 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 the stuff, the programming is wrapped up in our own brain. And so being in a position where you, you understand that change is necessary and that you yourself have to initiate that change. <clears throat> that, and like you said, it could be the change in how you interact in relationships, how you receive uh, other people, how you show up um, in, in life and different experiences skills that you might need to acquire. Maybe you don't have them. You might need to get some in order to make that change happen. So there's a, there's a ton there, like, you know, going back to when you said you got this, this paper, this medical paper, you know, on, on uh, something that you didn't, yeah, you didn't understand, which I wouldn't understand either, but you recognize there was something in it that mattered to you and it could create a solution in your life. So you may not need it to understand all of that information, but I would imagine as you got into partnership and you began the foray into business in this new health journey, you began to learn and develop skills and understanding that knowledge in a rapid basis because you recognized that the change needed to happen within you. Am I on track with that? Um, Absolutely. And I mean, in that case, so Professor Fraser, I mean, he, he died 10 years ago, but I was fortunate to spend 10 years with him. So he ended up emigrating to, to England. And then we basically did all this R and D together and built the, built the company and so you know which was just an an amazing apprenticeship because I just got to learn all of this physics biology um eastern eastern medicine Chinese medicine etc and then um yeah exactly that 
One of the other interesting things that you mentioned early that I, I, I connected with is that through the experience of you kind of going to France and, and thinking that, you know, being in that environment, you mentioned uh, wine and climbing and these kinds of things that maybe would solve the problem that you had at that time and not, that not working, you returned and went back to school to get an MBA. And so I think it's interesting that at that time in the world, and even today, there's this mindset that kind of prevails. Certainly, it's very popular. I know, at least in, in, in North America, very much so in the United States, that the drive to go and get this secondary higher level college degree education. And so there was obviously some of that instilled in you at that time, where it's like, what am I going to do with my life? Oh, I better go back to university. But yet that wasn't the solution to to your life and your problems. So no, I mean, I mean, in actual fact, it most likely, well, it, it definitely held me back. If if at the time, if at the time I had just probably gone to really experienced practitioners and people who knew what they were doing to get my health back um and taken the time to recover, I'm yeah, I'm sure that six, seven years would have been <laughs> would have been a year or two instead. Um, but yes, obviously I was deep well, you every every kid is deeply programmed to do education because you go to school every day. So you just think, oh well, I'll I'll go back and do more education. <laughs> Um, I think what's cool about that is recognizing the value of the education that you've received, I guess I would call it real world education in the area of business and entrepreneurship. And then there's also more specific education around the unique aspects of the health industry that your business operates in. You know, what, 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 what would you place the value of, or what would you share with someone who's listening and they're Maybe they've they're college educated, or they they they're they're looking at bringing their children up, thinking you need to go get a college degree. Not to say there's anything wrong with that, but when you think about entrepreneurship and bringing it into your life and 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 becoming in, immersed in that world, what's the value of the learning lessons you get in that experience versus your own experience when you spent time in a university style education? Yeah, I mean they're so they're so different. I I guess I would split it, I would split it almost into people like people and relationships. So in real in real entrepreneurialism and in building a business, I mean this is going to sound really awful, but I'm going to say it anyway. You know, this um, we were having a party once with some other entrepreneurs, and we were trying to work out what the creed of an entrepreneur was. And this is going to sound really crass, and it's a bit jokey. But it's basically reap all the rewards and everyone else can do it. And I'm I am exaggerating, but the second part of everyone else can do it. In the end, in business, it's really about relationships, um, encouraging other people, um, mentoring other people, having really, really great culture, uh, you know, for all your for all your employees, because in the end, as a business owner, you know, there's only one of you. In our case, we've got we've got 42 people. So really, if I wasn't doing anything, still 41 people are are doing something. So that that's far far more important. So I say in the real world, learning you know learning about relationships, how to interact with people, how to get the best out of people, is just so so important. And that is definitely not taught you know, when you're studying textbooks and books. Um, and I'd say, but on the MBA front, it's interesting. And you know, obviously I know a lot of other entrepreneurial friends. I say that actually the ones who haven't studied business, accounting, finance, MBAs, et cetera, I, they, they, do, they do sometimes struggle just not understanding P&Ls and balance sheets and, you know, how to manage cash flow and stuff. And that that can get them into trouble unless they're fortunate enough to recognize really early on to pair themselves up with a you know a CFO type who who can who can do that. So I, I I would say that's probably the one thing that did come out of my MBA. My eyes can't be like I know what I'm looking at with with numbers and finance, and that isn't necessarily in my genius spot, which is more creativity, invention, science, etc. But I, you know, it, but it is a good foundation for sure. But I don't know that you need to do an MBA to do it. You could, you could probably hire a, an accountant or read a few, you know, read a few courses on that. That would be a lot shorter. 
Yeah. So having, you know, in other words, that even though it's not something in your, in your zone of genius or your unique ability, as we would say, it's still fundamental knowledge that's been valuable for you in business. And so I think the takeaway for there, for the listener is that the teaching point is you, you can't operate a business without having some idea what the numbers are or watching your numbers. And if you're not watching them, someone in the business needs to be, and they need to be communicating it to you, I think is the takeaway. So you need well, to have the right and, people and on the then, as a as, a, as an owner, even if you've got someone watching them, they're not, they're probably not going to take those capital allocation decisions. I mean, that that's still on you. So it's still at some level, I think you have to understand them. Well, in capital allocation, agree, actually, he says he can't read a PL statement. So maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> well, I asked him that once a long time ago. But. I, I like that you mentioned capital allocation, because that really goes into <clears throat> understanding where where you feel as the entrepreneur who's who's driving the ship, who's you know forging ahead with the vision, where the right allocation of capital is going to bring the best return on investment, whether that's in human human power as far as employed staff, what's going to help you grow and scale, technology, new paths of investment. You know, I know that that's something that you're presently working on. You've got a new uh, uh, technology that's going to provide some haptic feedback. Uh, around things that you're doing, that's a wearable tech that you're that you're working on right now, and that's a that's an investment of both capital of human energy and 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 dollars. I know that's going into the creation of that technology. So, thinking about that, maybe maybe walking down that path for a moment. When you've been thinking about growing the the practice that you've built with with practitioners, helping them in this kind of energy work that you guys do. Now moving into a lot more tech-oriented space on how that's going to vault into the future. How did that come about for you? At what point did the vision strike you that this is the direction we need to go as a company? And 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 kind of where where did the where did the momentum shift to take you in that new direction with your business? So so originally when we met, Peter we moved to England. You know, we we spent years just refining our main well our main system that can read the basic health and energy of your of your body and then this um device called a my health that will trigger a healing response so like we we were primarily an r d company then and actually in terms of capital allocation probably a mistake we made way back at the beginning is we i we were so obsessed with making the best healing system and product we didn't actually invest that much in in, in marketing or growing Salesforce. So in retrospect, I think we grew slower earlier on than perhaps if we'd, if I'd known, known some of those things. Um, but then move, I guess moving on from, from there at this stage, so I had a company for 22 years and, it, but at this, but at this point we've developed out such a sort of an, an amazing amount of intellectual property that we realized it's basically wasted on it's basically wasted on one company or one channel. And so it's sort of like the um, I try to remember the name of it. I think it's called a grow like a growing star. Um, so our nest practitioner business, like a growing star, it kick, it kicks off cash flow, you know, it has good marketing and sales force these days. Um, so then it's like, you know, what do you do with that excess? excess cash and so for us it's like well we can take some of that excess cash in the ip and spin out other companies from it so you know you were mentioning a wearable so we've just formed you know what i've got there's a box right there i've actually got it right there there you go nice <laughs> on my desk but yeah. um that, that's the prototype version or is that one of the first to market versions um that is a prototype it won't be on the market for seven months like we have a little little bit of iterations to go um but yeah so anyway so for example some of the ip that we created in the first company we can use in this wearable um to basically deliver biosignatures in in your body to stimulate a healing response in your body just just when you're wearing it and yes anyway yeah so and then i i would just call it a process of d of debundling so in our main company We've debundled some of the IP, uh, like we're beginning to license out to all of the all of these other companies, um, and then basically, you know, you just try and work out or not try. You work out all the different channels you can market that IP. So in our case, we can improve 
improve drinking water or give different drinking water different effects we can improve supplements um we can put our technology in a lot of different devices so that we can get both better analysis and also the correction of, of health problems so yeah that's the yeah i guess that's the process and it's not just capital allocation it's time uh time allocation which is probably the most precious resource of all <laughs> And, and as you spread uh, wider with, like you say, the unbundling, I love the analogy of that. I think that's a really powerful uh, way of looking at what you're doing in your particular business. You're you're taking one business and then you're spreading out those components to add value in other categories to some degree. And it really is creating almost either completely independent businesses or I, I would imagine it's also creating a lot of collaboration opportunities for you as well. Because you, as you, you know, when you spend 22 years in business, you, you don't do that without meeting some great people along the way. So I'm sure that's opened up specifically in your industry, a lot of ancillary business and, and possible partnerships that you're probably infusing into this unbundling process. Would that be a fair assessment? Um, yeah, absolutely. And it, actually, this year, it's sort of, I think it probably goes back to mindset and beliefs and, you know, what you, what you think about. But like the moment we decided to unbundle and sort of think think of things from more of an industry ecosystem rather than an individual company, suddenly all of the all of these new new partners have just come out come out of the woodwork, um, and actually also investors as well because it's a much a much bigger picture. Well, and that's something we before we hit the the go button here on our recording, we talked a little bit about um, you know capital raising and you know, bringing people along with a vision of an idea and, and and try to raise capital to help make that idea a reality. That's something it sounds like you have a little bit of experience with. I think we have a lot of people who are listening in. We, we have a lot of real estate investors, people in different kinds of entrepreneurial business. We have some folks that are, are maybe not an entrepreneur now, but maybe it's something they've connected with, they've always wanted to be. So your story could inspire someone on how they might go about getting their idea to market. So tell us a little bit about what you've learned in and what are some of the challenges you would you would say around capital raising and the need to do that and then what are some of the advantages of of pushing through those challenges that you've discovered you know i might give almost the opposite example and then and then i'll get into capital raising um so when so when we first started our company we were sick very little to no energy we had absolutely no money I didn't even have any really not much of an employment history because I was fired from my first job. So from an investor point of view, you know, if it's like triple X, don't touch that person. <laughs> um, and so, it, so when we initially got going, I, I literally, literally only had 20 pounds, um, this was pounds, so maybe $30,000 to, to our name. But we just did absolutely everything the hard way. So, you know, the scientists did it for equity, the coder, uh, did it for um they did it for for equity and you know we got this first system made and I pre-sold I pre-sold a whole bunch before we actually had had the whole thing made to get some money so I could pay my assistant and all of that so I I mean and the motto of the story is you don't necessarily need capital you you could just need imagination um and and some determination so I'll just say that now, having done that journey, it's incredibly hard journey, and it's not one you know. I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that these these days. Of course, uh, I well, actually, I guess I would just I would just say from that point of view, like how I saw it is like just make you know whatever that product or service you're doing. I just put all my attention into that and just making it absolutely amazing you know for that first customer and then for the first 10 and first 100 etc um so i'd say that's probably more important than than money and i also think if you do that and you really think through that then actually investors will recognize that you're doing that and then they're much more likely to to, to invest in you and so i guess you know plus forward we never raised any money before last year um and then for us it's literally because we're doing this whole debungling like we have like we, we've we've invested a certain amount of money in the in the new company and in all the product 
Um, but because we've got, because we, I guess we've got more confidence and business experience, it's more logical for us to now add in other investors' capital because we because we know how to scale it, um, and then we can do that. You know, I, I basically because it's a spin out model, we can spin out a new company every three or so years and do it again, again and again. And so for that, it makes sense for us to to, to raise to raise money to do that faster. And if that answers your question. It it does actually even even better than I had anticipated because I think the the story is really powerful to understand. Again, you had all these hardships just from a health category, recovering from that. That that produces a lot of um not only wisdom, but but buy-in and passion for what it is you do. By by going from bedridden to being mobile and functional as a human being. If that doesn't, you know, give you some passion for what it is you're doing, I don't know anything that will. So I would imagine that getting in, even though that hard work was there, your ability to get that, that service level out to people, that first customer, the first 10, the first 100, as you said, a lot of that was driven by, by that passion, that drive. And because you were, you were a walking, literally a, a walking example. Well, no, I was, of, I was that example. Do. Yeah. I was basically healing myself and then taking that knowledge to heal others, basically, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but, but recognizing that it's hard and the entrepreneurship journey, uh, you're, you know, in my, my personal experience and in the, the many people that we've interviewed on the show and the many people that I've, I've met with and talked and, you know, broken bread with the conversations are very similar in that there is a lot of hardship that goes along with, with working through what it's like to be an entrepreneur and be a business owner. And their challenges are very high. But if you have drive, you have some passion, you have some dedication, determination, and you have something of value to offer. You're trying to help the end user, the customer, the, the client, whoever the end user is, the product, service, whatever. If that's where your focus goes, the money kind of flows to some degree. Because it's, if you help, it's pretty much person. simple. It is as simple as that. It's, um, if you produce something of great value to society and to other people, the rule, the rewards will be there. I mean, it, it just appears. I mean, I, yeah, I've seen it over and over again. Um, more than, yeah, I can just, just so, just so many examples of any insane project that we've, I mean, obviously getting the whole thing going in the first place, but I say for whatever reason, a whole bunch of practitioners in Australia, this is back 22 years, believe, believed in this product that they'd never seen and paid us a few few thousand dollars per uh, per system and that that basically got got us going um god i could give you i could probably give you a lot a lot of examples or like we were going to make a film well we've made four films at this point but the first film we made was called the living matrix a new a new science of healing i didn't have a clue how to make a film but actually one of our customers was uh, owned a little video advertising agency and so like you know we te we teamed up with them but but internally you know our, our other um like our on our leadership team they're like what are you doing why are you wasting money on a film you know we can't really afford it or all this sort of stuff um but just having that faith and that that film actually ended up breaking a lot of the it, the space is called energy medicine or bioenergetics this is in uh, 2008 and tens of millions of people ended up watching that film which massively helped help the company um you know it might have been beginner's luck i'm not sure but um but yeah it's, it's, it's to that point you just have faith and i you know, i'd say one one other example in the negative so our second film was called Choice Point Align Your Purpose. And unfortunately, our previous film partner was going through a divorce, so they couldn't be involved. Um, so we decided to do it ourselves, but we really didn't know how to edit, do cameras, all this. So and then we were hiring all these people to do it and went way, way over budget. Um, I think we went and then and it, it became more of a grandiose thing. It was going to be this whole um, a sort of almost like a save the world project anyway and we we got we basically got over our skis on that one went a million million dollars into debt um and in that example and then again it was like you know our accountant at this time it's like well you really can't afford payroll next month and then it's like you've got two children 
you got this choice point thing and you know you got your nest business and you have to choose between them so so we chose we chose nest um to we didn't actually have to repay the in the, well, no, technically we didn't have to repay the money because it was a failed venture um but we actually chose we actually chose to actually just give um give that person nest stock and then we repaid the repaid the money over the next three years which uh from my point of view, it was a very important part of, rep, of reputation because then you just have a good reputation in, in the market for yeah fu- future investors or anything like that. Well, an, an interesting takeaway that comes up for me in that story is uh, pushing through the adversity of people being naysayers to starting the first film. The first film being a major uh, advantage to actually spearheading the growth of the company. So so that that being, you know, again, that's a lesson about sticking to your guns and, and the vision that you have and the purpose and how you feel like it's gonna it's gonna work for you. And then secondary one is recognizing that um, just because you had success in one area before a film doesn't necessarily mean that you can duplicate that success again based on a variety of factors. So there's so there's kind of a couple interesting lessons there. Well, and there's and a third lesson to it. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear it. There's a third lesson in in the cycles of time. So that was, um, what are we in, 23, 22? I don't know what we're in. But anyway, um, 10, 10, 10, 11 years ago when we made that film, um, although it wasn't a wild success at the time, from a credibility point of view, because we filmed like John Ford Azurio, Richard Branson, um, Dal Lama, Barbara Marks Hubbard, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, whole uh, Arch, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a whole bunch of global leaders but it did actually help it did actually help the credibility um of our company and i guess us ourselves and actually over the years we then incorporated a lot of that into our nest company of all our practitioners and clients so in the long run actually it made all of our products better even though at the time it looked pretty pretty dismal so it it, uh, sometimes you don't quite know why you're doing things and actually a lot of that thinking of that that like the philosophy we said about understand you are aligning first be the change that came out of making that um that movie and, and a course that went with it and obviously that those principles they, they stick with you over time so it helps you in the future so yeah it, it's kind of like uh taking uh turning lemons into lemonade effectively uh from a from a film scenario and in a project um where the intention and the idea of the project didn't didn't match, didn't work out as as expected. But through the the aftermath comes a lot of opportunity. It's kind of like uh, you know, in a lot of these these movies or whatever, you see an area of of, of land that's been impacted by a by a natural disaster of some kind, and everything's destroyed. But through the the aftermath of that destruction, there ends up being lush and fertile soil and things grow and everything kind of rebounds on a quicker basis. It's, it's sort of like that, but really in, in, a, in a real life story of the business life. And so you're able to take all these assets that you had and then convert them into more, more tools and utilization down the road. I really think it's interesting. You mentioned through the course of that film and these, some of these global leaders that you were able to interview and, and, and have film of, even though the film didn't do what it, what it intended, the relationships that were created and the reputation ripple effect still caused a, an overall, you know, maybe not directly measurably, but an intangible uh, measure of increase in your overall business, which is really fascinating because I think a lot of people don't recognize the value. It's not that we don't recognize the value in relationships. We don't know how the, the people that we meet on the road of life are necessarily going to come up and, and show up at a later stage of our life in, in a positive way. And I've, I've got a number of experiences like that in, in my own life, certainly not with the Dalai Lama, but uh, uh, you know, those similar experiences, you can think back and say, wow, that one meeting, that one chance, you know, course that I went to and I, and I met these people, how has that played a positive role in my life and, and future endeavors? And so I really think that's a powerful lesson for people to take away on this conversation today. Uh, yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Well, uh, thank you so much, Harry, for the time that you've shared with us today. You've shared a lot about not only your your personal journey, your your challenges, 
what led you to uh, delve into the world of business through a very unfortunate set of circumstances that really brought you to it. I think a lot of people, again, can, can learn from your experience, um, your, your real world challenges and how you were able to overcome those and turn it into something really amazing after 22 years. One of the questions I would have for you, we like to kind of end our show thinking about all that you've done in 22 years in starting this business, the people that you've impacted, the practitioners that work with Ness who've then gone out and helped people, especially in the health category, really on a, on a bit of a global scale, now transitioning to wearable tech and, and, and the new environment of how you're going to unbundle that technology for everybody. You may not know this, but you're really showing up as a hero because of all that work and all the people that you've impacted, people that might be in that bedridden scenario that you were, that you've raised them up from a health perspective in, into, into being um, functional human beings in the world again. You're really showing up for a hero by, by all the work that you've done. Our question for you is, who do you most want to be a hero to? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, in in a way, it's probably to my to my younger self, who was sick, or in a way, anyone who's sick. Um, just just so just so someone who's sick knows that they can get better. I mean, I think that's that's fundamentally the most important thing. You probably like say to say to other business owners, but, but yeah, well. So sometimes other business owners have have a sickness that affects them where they don't know what's going on with their business. And so they need help there too. But uh, I mean, yeah. I, I really think it, it it does hit home that it's you really you you're looking to impact people who are in a position in life where they they need help, they need to get their health on track. And there's a way to do it. And you're you're paving a way for that with with your technology and, and the things that you guys have done. So really fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us on the program today. For everyone watching, everyone listening in, uh, if you're on the YouTubes, make sure you go ahead and click through. There's an amazing playlist of some great information that just popped up like that on the screen. So go ahead and click through that. Make sure you continue your journey of learning. As always, we recommend if you haven't done so already, make sure to swing over to sevensteps.ca. That's sevensteps.ca and get our seven-step report on the proper learning journey to fill your brain and fill your soul with how the infinite banking concept can work you. Uh, work for you and add, add uh, value into your life. And Harry, thank you again for being with us and all the, the wisdom that you've shared on your journey of life. Hopefully it'll inspire the new generation of entrepreneurs watching this program uh, to take control of their life and become financially independent, but also uh, take control of their health while they're at it. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure doing the podcast with you.